Chocolate helped too. I think uh, chocolate and the comfort really worked well together. Okay, well we're going we're going for 4:30, so we have about 35 minutes or a little bit more than that, uh, close to that. So uh, should we do a, a Q and A session here? We've had we've covered a lot. We've covered a lot of of topics. We've given a lot of examples, a lot of metaphors, and yeah, we would like to again come back to our Ring the Bell of Practical Application. So if there's something that you've been listening to today and something that starts to come up into awareness, let's address that. What are you were uh, saying earlier on that um, the more awake you become because you're, you're dissolving the, the guilt, so therefore innocence comes into your life more and you're giving the example that because of what you do, you're having happiness all the time because all you're doing is going around the world and inviting happy people to be with you. So, can you just elaborate a little bit on, for example, me, I don't have the life that you do, so I'm awakening. I mean, at the moment, it's a full-time job. It's <laughs> 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 forgiveness, and it's standing back, and linking it to the Holy Spirit, and when you think, when you go on a bit more, and something else comes along, and, oh, here we go, do it all over again. So when I get onto that next step, where... The innocence is going to be coming more to me because there's, there's less guilt. How do you see that? Because you're seeing through different eyes, aren't you? So I, I get what you're saying, what you do, the happiness is, is there and the innocence is there because of what you do. But if I'm in a different way of life, how, how, does, how would I see innocence? How do I sense it? How do I feel it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, Francis was just mentioning before the break how how really everything is is a love extension of love or a call for love and Jesus does address that in the course he he says the Holy Spirit sees everything as love or a call for love so love will be your response whether you're being loved and you feel wonderful like thank you thank you thank you or there's a call for love and your, your heart is open and you're pouring out the love and offering that healing answer through you. You feel the love, your heart cords are resonating either way, whether you seem to be receiving it or being extended through like that. But Jesus does qualify it. He says the Holy Spirit sees everything as love or a call for love. He, he then says, you cannot do this because you are too bound to form and do not know what content is. So we're back to form and content. Uh, when the mind is attached to form, it's attached to a self-concept, an image. And it's always going to be fighting, protecting, defending that image. It doesn't even matter if it's a, a, a Course in Miracles teacher. You could be identified as a Course in Miracles student or teacher, but if there's some kind of identity around something on earth, anything, on earth, there's going to be guilt. Because spirit has no guilt at all. But the mind that's identified with this mask, it's got a lot of pockets of guilt. You might say it's been pushed down for a millennium and it has to come up to the surface. Uh, where we're staying right now is a, like a little loft. Nick and Anne have put me up in the loft with a lava lamp. Anybody? I, I, I need a, I need a, a night light. And so I turn on the lava lamp and that keeps me warm at night, throws a little heat to my, and also I get to watch these globs come up. Globs. Some of you might remember that, uh, that movie uh, X-Men, Days of Future Past, where uh, what's this, Wolverine go, has, is, gets sent back to the past. To make the save the day, and he lands in this apartment with this big lava lamp, and the song is Roberta Flack. The first time 
Ever I saw your face. A song from the era of the lava lamp. So I'm, I'm sitting there watching this lava lamp and hearing Roberta Flack's voice faintly up in this loft where they've got me. But uh, anyway, I watch the lava lamp and I see these globs coming up and reformulating. And that's really what's going on with this sense of guilt coming up. We have this repressed guilt that has to come up. And like in the lava lamp, lamp, when you heat this stuff, it just comes globbing up and globbing up, then it drops down and globs up. It's like your mind being healed. There are these pockets that have to come up into awareness. And so, all they are, are, are identifications with body, with persons, because we, we can talk about what forgiveness really is. Forgiveness is, is tranquil and quiet and quietly does nothing. Jesus says, it looks and watches and waits and judges not. Forgiveness is not really active, it's just this presence of pure innocence and love in you that knows that there's really no problems and never has been. But the mind that gets identified with the body has all these memories. It could even be seeming past life memories. There's just these issues and memories that recirculate the guilt over and over and over until we let it go. So, it's not like you have to travel the world, you know, to, to live the happy dream of the innocence. Look at Nick, he's, he goes swimming in his swimming pool, and uh, he's sitting back there meditating, and, and knows where he's, he's at. He's, 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 <laughs> he's tucked away here, just sitting there, and taking a swim in a warm pool, and, and having the good life. But it doesn't, it, it's not necessarily a matter of traveling the world, it's just, if you would hide nothing, if you would welcome every emotion to come up, like to, to come to the surface, and then be willing to let it move through, you know, without clinging to it, or trying to project blame for it onto somebody, or trying to analyze it, and analyze the darkness, you know, none of those things work. And so I would say that, that you're on your way. It, it can seem very like full-time work. Uh, once you invite the healing, then it, it's almost like the emotions get stirred up. And uh, I one time heard a beautiful analogy from uh, Louise Hay. She said, healing your mind is like uh, cleaning a turkey pan. Uh, we have a, a holiday over in the United States called Thanksgiving where you you put a big turkey in a pan and you roast it, and then you eat it, you stuff it, you roast it, you eat it, then you've got all this sticky black crud baked on the pan. She said, well, you have to throw water in the pan, then you have to throw soap detergent in the pan, then you have to scrub, and the water gets a lot dirtier <laughs> before the pan gets clean. Uh, it's, it's going to get really dirty before that pan, that turkey pan, is clean. And I thought, that's a perfect analogy for the mind. Mm. You start calling on the Holy Spirit, you got your detergent in there, your suds go on there, you feel like <laughs> you're in the washing. <laughs> you know, you want, oh God, what am I, not? now my life is really messy. We were just talking about that with Mina. She said, when I was married, I know I was sleepwalking, but at least it was somewhat stabilized, <laughs> and then, uh, then I call upon the Holy Spirit and oh man, it gets messy. It can seem to get messier before it gets cleaner, because the repressed guilt and repressed emotions have to come up into awareness. And so, many of us know it gets, it can get very intense when we are so willing. But it's good to know that ahead of time. I mean, I. I kind of like, I remember reading through the course, and I read the text, workbook, manual, so I'm digging around in the teacher's manual one day with Jesus, and I'm like looking at the ten characteristics of uh, a teacher of God, and then I, I get, I'm looking at the first one, trust, and he not only talks about trust, but he talks about the stages of the development of trust, and I'm like, oh, this is great, I need to hear this. How many stages are there? Six. Ooh, this is interesting. Six stages. Where am I? He's like, don't, don't try to ask. <laughs> just, 
<laughs> look, so I read one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm like, six. So then I, I started to look at the six. Four out of the six are disturbing, unsettling, <laughs> upsetting. I'm like, four out of six, that's two-thirds of the journey back to God <laughs> is dark. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, that's sobering. But it didn't stop me from going for it, but at least it was like a check from Jesus. Like, I'm going to give it to you straight. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to pretend it's this. I'm going to give it to you straight. Four out of the six are difficult. Four out of the six stages. The last one is, is heavenly. But <laughs> to get to number six, you've got to go, that's four out of the first five <laughs> are, are tough. And if any of you have studied the literature, read the lives of the mystics and the saints, you know, St. John of the Cross, and whether you read Eastern mystics or Western mystics or whatever, it's daunting. You know, they'll basically write it out for you like, St. John of the Cross, talk, he's the one who coined the phrase, dark night of the soul. You know, we're going for infinity, we're going for eternity, we're going for heaven. And if you had an offer of, okay, here's heaven, and here are the authentic steps you need to take, and four of the six stages are going to be tough, what are you going to do? Heaven is our home. Are we going to stay wandering in the dark, or are we going home? I say we're going home. And I say, it's kind of like, uh, for me it was like those, you know when the United States started to send those rockets up and to go to the moon, they start launching all those big Saturn rockets. You remember those Saturn, Saturn rockets, they had a tiny, tiny, tiny little capsule on the top <laughs> where the astronauts were, and massive stages of fuel. The tiny little tap capsule that holding the astronauts and the massive stages of fuel. Fuel. So, Jesus is like telling me, that's kind of like what this journey is going to take. You've got, you're strapped in on top of a lot of fuel. <laughs> and it's massive. I'm going to get you out of the gravitational pull of Earth. <laughs> of the ego, of the world. And we're going into orbit and beyond. <laughs> you're going to feel weightless there when you get up with me in orbit, and then we're taking you even beyond time and space back to eternity. Our natural home, back to the kingdom of heaven. So, just think about that when you're working with the Course. I always thought, as I'm just packing on more rocket fuel, just in case. <laughs> you know, the dark night of the soul, pack on a few more things of rocket fuel, because we need to go into orbit, we need to, to escape the gravity, the heaviness of a death wish. Basically the ego is a death wish, and we're going back to heaven in awareness, and so we're, we are joined together. In the early years for me it was a lot of struggle, and I was more like the ancient, um, these ancient mystics where it was stark and struggle and fighting, and this, and, oh gosh, if I ever wrote the journals out on that, it'd be, I, I mean, I must have cried for, I don't know, 20 years I think I cried. And then now that I'm getting into the miracles and the innocence, I'm attracting the reflections of that innocence. So I'm seeing miracle workers all over the world. And we're joining hands, we're joining arm in arm to walk back to the light. And we're supporting each other. Back in the old days, you know, I, I didn't know who to call. When you're waking up and forgiving, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? You know, they can't help you. Even. Uh, but, but now, there's all kinds of support. You know, it's really massive. It's like a massive network of love and light and support. And that's good news. You know, it's, it's there for you. And I, I would say, take advantage of it, really, when you go along. about 
not being good or not, you know, like the idea of done nothing wrong, I've done nothing right. Because uh, for me, the ego seems to want to get things right, you know, the fear of being wrong, which I really see deeply. So, yeah, I think maybe want to speak about that, David, done nothing wrong, done yeah. nothing right. Yeah, I can speak to that. It's, it's like Jesus really simplifies it for us with the Course, and he says, in terms of the sleeping mind, you have a wrong mind and a right mind, and the right mind is, the, is your healed and whole mind, and the wrong mind is the one where all the guilt is. And that's where the split, you know when we talk about schizophrenia, having a split mind, that's the split. One aspect of the mind is blazing light, and one is very dark, and so Jesus had said in the Bible, you cannot serve both God and money, uh, you can't serve two masters, he said. In terms of the split mind, you can't serve both light and darkness, even though that's what schizophrenia is about, trying to serve both light and darkness simultaneously, that's, it's pretty wild. But what I would say is that that, that split in the mind is so unnatural, it's not how God created the mind to be split at all. It's God created whole mind, and so when it's split, that projection comes from a way to relieve the split by seeing it on the screen. Just like uh, the projector analogy where the light passes through the, the film and then off, it goes off onto the screen of images. So, the way that the mind tries to relieve itself of the split is it projects out a world and then it starts to interpret a dualistic world. Right behaviors, and wrong behaviors. And then it's trying to come around to right behaviors and to let go of the wrong behaviors, but it's like an impossible situation. There is no behaviors that, that can ever be perfect. It's, it's more of, we have to get beyond the screen, we have to get back into the holistic mind and perceive the world with the Holy Spirit. So, that's why I say nobody's ever done anything wrong or right. If you still see wrong behavior and right behavior, which is just a stepping stone, uh, you, you still haven't forgiven, because uh, God didn't create wrong behavior and right behavior, it's still trying to take the split and put it onto behavior. And that's why the Course teaches, you don't forgive somebody for what they did to you, or you don't forgive somebody for what they didn't do that you think they should have done. You forgive them for what they have not done. And that's what it means by that. It's like the behaviors is always the ego trying to project the, the guilt out onto the form. And so, if you notice, that's part of the ego's plan. It, it projects good behavior and bad behavior and then it, it lifts up heroes, and we have heroes and heroes, it lifts them higher and higher, and then it wants to rip them down. You know, whether it's rock stars, or movie stars, or sports stars, or whatever, it loves to build them up, build them up, build its idols higher and higher, and then it loves when there's, you know, a scam, a, a, a sh some kind of horrific story where they come ripping down. Uh, you know, it's like over with Great Britain, we could say, I remember when, uh, was it Prince William and Lady Di got married and the whole world went, oh, it's so sweet, and the royal wedding, the whole world stopped. We all were like, oh, it's a royal wedding. Everybody turned on their TV sets to watch the royal wedding. And then, things got a little rocky in the, the royal house, and everyone was like, oh, scandalous, scandalous. You see, the ego is trying to keep the mind so distracted with the form that you won't look inside your mind and, and accept the solution, the correction, but you get so caught up in the projection, the gossip, the ego just builds the idols up and rips them down. It's part of its whole system. And so you have heroes and villains. We have the tyrants, the ones that the world hates, and then we have the saints, the saints and the sinners. You see, even saints and sinners, it's not going to, 
how can we come back to wholeness if we keep perceiving saints and sinners? So, in the end, when people start to vilify tyrants and terrorists and everything like this, it's the, the Spirit saying, oh, please come back. Come back. You have to look at the terrorist in your own mind. <laughs> Uh, you, you have to forgive that evil belief, which is not coming from God, before you can forgive anyone. Because nobody's doing anything wrong or right. It's this big trick of trying to project it out in terms of all the behaviors. So that's really what I meant by saying that. And you can feel there's an ease that comes in. People love to be heard, you didn't do anything wrong. They go, Phew. And you didn't do anything right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that kind of takes the pride out of it all. <laughs> There's no awards for that. Oh, I didn't do anything right either. Uh, and which comes back to what Anne was talking about this morning. Do you want to be right or happy? Do you want to be right about the way the ego set up the world with its victims and victimizers, or would you rather be eternally happy? And that's really the question, you know, Shakespeare said, to be or not to be. That is the question, to, to be happy or to attempt to be right about separation. That's really our decision. Yes? Just something that's played in my mind for a few years, that the moment of separation, a tiny mad idea, is something in our world to a nuclear explosion, I mean, something that fragmented everything. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of metaphor, thinking of the Big Bang as like, a, like an explosion. There are many scientists that kind of do that. I think, um, I particularly like Brian Greene, you know, he has, he has mapped out the Big Bang. And our entire cosmos looks like a loaf of bread. He's mapped it out. So, so you have the little point at the beginning, which is where everything was whole, and then boom, after the explosion, it's like this big loaf of bread came out. Now what I like about a loaf of bread is because it's, it's just kind of fun to see the cosmos as a loaf of bread, and then wherever you seem to be inside, Whatever location you are, is where you perceive the loaf of bread from, from inside the loaf of bread. So we might say that the cosmos had a be seeming beginning and it has an end. That there is an end to the loaf of bread. <laughs> and, and you can forgive it at any point, if you can, can go beyond the veil of that whole explosion. And uh, where you determine yourself in terms of the coordinates, you know, is really just part of the, the misidentification. You're not in that loaf of bread. You're prior. You know how Jesus taught, before Abraham was, I am. Before the cosmic loaf of bread, I am. I am the bread of life. <laughs> it's better than I am the bread of the cosmos. Uh, that's the key. I very much know the God in me. And the God in others. And I'm not sure how to get in that tiny mad idea that maybe some of my life was spent in a loaf of bread, if you like. Um, although it's a projection, and I, and I do truly know that, it, it does seem a tragedy. Yeah, there's a line in the Course where Jesus says, delay is a tragedy in time, though unknown in heaven. So, to the extent where the answer is offered to us and we resist the answer, that's the tragedy. Jesus is saying, it's already been solved. It's, it's a done deal. Grace, just by the grace of God, everything has been solved. There are no problems whatsoever. And to, to push that away and say, mm, no, I, I don't want that, that's where we have this concept of delay. And he says it's, it's tragic in time. Okay, so I can be in peace and look at the line of 
cattle at the slaughterhouse can still be in peace. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel for them. Yet, as long as we believe, again, that, that there's life in this world, or that there are separate souls, or, you know, all those kind of concepts, then there's still going to be that sense of, of empathy. And Jesus is saying, what we need to do is come into true empathy, it means com come into complete alignment with the Christ mind, and, and feel the perfection. So really, that's, that's a call for love, you know, really seeing that call for love and sending the blessing consistently, not falling for the belief in, in attack. If we believe in slaughter of any kind, you know, there's, there, there's a delay maneuver going on. Yes? Um, Francis mentioned the holy instant earlier, I wonder if you could define that. She was sharing what I was sharing the other day in the car, yeah. Well, the holy instant is, you might say, the I amness. And the holy instant is not in time. A lot of times we, we grew up with history class and the timeline, and we have the past, and the arrow, and the future, and, and the present. The holy instant is not in the middle. Um, that's the ego's instant. The ego made up its own present moment, its own past and future, and the holy instant is prior to time. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He was speaking of the I amness of the holy instant. So, it's described in different ways, as, as Francis was saying, you cannot prepare for the holy instant without placing it in the future. So it's, it's really, you have to be really ready to, to start to receive that, because for many people, they're just not ready. They'll look at the Course and they'll say, well, if I cannot prepare for the Holy Instant, then why am I doing, reading a text, then why am I doing 365 <laughs> lessons? <laughs> What's the point of any of this? And, and those are, are, you might say, exercises in in, in the mind opening and becoming ready to approach the Holy Instant. But I would say, again, the purpose of the Course is to take the mind, put it in touch with the Holy Spirit, the internal teacher, and then the Holy Spirit will take you towards the Holy Instant. Mainly by focusing on desire, like he'll have you practice in countless situations, what do I really want to come of this? What is this for? Instead of like thinking, that you're going to the grocery store to buy groceries, then the Holy Spirit will say, well, what's, what are you really, <laughs> really going to the grocery store for? Ooh, Ooh holy encounters, he's like, you're getting closer. <laughs> you see how that is, we start to just lean into the Holy Spirit. I know the first time I started to uh, really practice the Course. Some of you are familiar with the prayer that's at the beginning of the Course. I am here only to be truly helpful, and here to represent Him who sent me. Do not have to worry about what to say or what to do. He who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever He wishes, knowing He goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let Him teach me to heal. Well, I thought, I need to practice that. And Jesus said, yeah, that's right, I want you, it's a prayer, but don't, I want you to practice it. So Jesus told me, every time you walk through a doorway, anywhere in time and space, before you walk through the doorway, I want you to pause and silently repeat that prayer to yourself before you go through the threshold. So before I went to the laundromat, before I went to the grocery store to visit my grandmother, all the different things I would do, I would pause and it really helped to reorient my mind, because I, was, I wanted to be oriented to, oh yeah, I want to remember what this is really for, so I can remember my purpose. So I found that very practical and helpful. And I would say then, as we go through the lessons, and we, we keep practicing the prayers and everything, it's just our desire for God is like a flame. It goes from a candle to a, a flame to 
a forest fire for God, <laughs> where we, our flame is so strong, and when we've got a forest fire going in our hearts, then we're ready to go for the Holy Instant. <laughs> The Holy Encounters related to Holy Instant. Yeah, the Holy Encounters are part of like, you might say your desire is, is growing more focused and stronger. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, going back to the cows. I'm going back to the cows. <laughs> and I realize that everyone in this world has been hurt in one way or another. And when you look at those cows with those sad eyes, you see yourself. So the first thing you have to do to the cows is forgive them, because they're part of you. And if you see it that way, then forgiveness is opening up so that you're, no long, you're trusting and you're no longer afraid. And unforgiveness is closing. So if you close down, you can't see the cows, and you can't see the other human beings that is walking yeah. around. Yeah, that's it. So that's it. You're opening up towards. You're a opening yourself to, yeah. and and you have to trust, and and you're saying to yourself, okay, now I'm not going to be hurt because you've forgiven the projection in the cows. Yeah. They're not going to die anyway. We know that, but that's a sort of little. Yeah, it's like a healing of. Yeah. of the only way. It's you, a heart healing. Yeah, it's like opening up to spiritual vision, and it's only by yeah. believing that that something in the world could be murdered, yes. which would still be a projection of the ego. Yeah. Like, the ego is the belief in murder. Mm. We need to forgive the ego right in the yes, core so that, of us. And we can also, th we then forgive ourselves for even imagining that we could be hurt in this weirdo world yes. anyway. Yes, that's it. Mm. So it's a sort of, anyway, that's my Yeah, name. beautiful, beautiful. That's very beautiful. Yeah, I had a lovely reflection about coming down, Sam, and uh, I, was, I had a thought, and I was telling Sam that, um, you know, I had a thought about, uh, oh, your loved ones are all with the angels, and I'm saying, because I've had trouble with tears lately, and um, as I thought about that deeply, about my children, I can't hurt them, and my loved ones are just the angels <laughs> and I as I expressed it literally uh, an arc passed on wheels not kidding a huge quite a big wooden arc you know passed um, like Noah's arc <laughs> <laughs> on wheels it was like I couldn't believe it covered so many symbols around the arc and, uh, you know my calling and everything and uh, just just like this uh, lady said, you know, just it just sort of felt like there is only love, and, and I just want to live like I'm at home with the angels, and everybody is loved. <laughs> you know, and it was like yes, <laughs> yes. You know. And the ark passed on wheels. <laughs> yeah. The ark of peace has entered two by two, and mm. there were, you were sending your two teenagers. <laughs> On the ark, representing all teenagers in yeah. the history of the universe, <laughs> and and healing that. Yes. I'm well, just thinking, like until the course, or maybe just before that, I kind of felt like that cow. You know, I still do sometimes, to be honest with you, because I've still got to go to the slaughterhouse at the end. I know that's coming. <laughs> like, but like you were saying, you were looking at the cow, and the cow was like, "What's going on?" And I kind of feel like. You know, Jesus has looked at me and I'm still in the thing, you know. And I don't know how it's going to happen, and I don't think they know, do you? But I still feel like that cow in my life. Yeah. But it was like feeling sorry for the cow, and I, I was kind of thinking, because I am that cow. Mm -hmm. I mean, that cow is me. Hopefully, no one eats me once I'm dead, like, but you know. Yeah, yeah well, just, there's, there's Jesus there gazing with those wise eyes, you know, just just gaze over there it, it, the, into Jesus' eyes, you know, and and feel the rest and assurance, like, oh, okay. You know, because that's where the peace comes in. Uh, Less of the cup. Beautiful. Oh, my experience of, of the eye to eye with the animal was actually a ray of fish. So it was one in one eye because it was on top of the water. 
you know. And um, it was looking at me so steadily and so clearly, I sort of knew that the, f the fish was looking at me and I was looking at the fish. But there wasn't anything there at all. It was just, um, well, I mean, it could have been anybody's eye. It could have been a human eye or a cow's eye. And it was just that moment. Mm -hmm. And I knew everything. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Do you want to go with him? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think this comes up. It's about that damn cow again. It's the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my father-in-law is kind of living with us at the minute, and he's kind of got a Parkinson thing. And he's not sad actually, but he kind of lives a little bit in the past. You know, he kind of that's where he dwells. Let's put it that way. He seems to dwell. And my partner sort of feels sorry about that. And I'm thinking, well, what's what's the sorry? You know, what's that? What are you looking at for that? Anyway, um, doesn't it come back to? Isn't you know? Isn't sadness, sorry, grieving, isn't this cow, the belief in death, actually, that we're looking at, playing out in those stalls and going to the inevitability of whatever's there? Isn't that what we're seeing, kind of thing? Isn't, you know, isn't that what's really, from an ego point of view, that's the, isn't that a strong thing for it to invite you to take part in, in that scenario? I'm, yeah. being, you know, I'm being sad about this. Isn't that an invitation for me to go somewhere and get involved in sadness, loss, grief, and all those things, and death. Yeah, there's actually three subsections in the Course. Attraction to sickness is one title. Attraction to pain is another subtitle. And attraction to death. So, the ego is a death wish, and it, it makes a world, makes a cosmos, and it will draw forth images and witnesses to that. So, so yeah, and, and only by forgiving the ego, by forgiving the death wish in the mind, does that interpretation disappear. Because mm -hmm. as long as that wish to die is still kept in mind, then there will be seeming accusations, seeming attacks, seeming defense, <clears throat> all, you invite the whole thing get the whole menagerie of false witnesses, fear, false evidence appearing real. You know, you get that whole range of that. So yeah, that you're basically facing the death wish, you know, when there's grief, all those emotions that you, you mentioned, that's just an, an opportunity to to forgive the ego and accept the atonement. Yeah, isn't it the kind of the living for me it's like the living out of that loss and death and darkness is a re is some kind of belief, reality, if I'm in that. Yeah. And that, you know, like, tr joy and, and the love and life, there's no room for, for that. For that dark, that, that, belief, that sort of idea, or that belief, there's no, there's, there's no room for it. It just, it just pushes it completely out of awareness, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, here we are in, in England, so of course Shakespeare really brought up a lot. He basically exposed the death wish. I was in Mexico with Sam and she said, oh, I love Shakespeare, let's go see Macbeth. <laughs> so uh, we watched Macbeth. It was like, okay, Shakespeare again. Excellent job there, flushing up the death wish, you know, because he was a master at, at bringing that up. I mean, Romeo and Juliet, you know, here we are, we, we're searching for love. We're searching for everlasting love and, and he plays it out you know, in Romeo and Juliet, in the most, I mean, I remember the last time I watched, I think I saw the one with Leonardo, and maybe it was Claire Danes, or it was Romeo and Juliet acted out, and in the end, the only solution was, was one dies, the other one, I'll join you in death. And I thought, oh, Shakespeare has done it again. <laughs> well, that's good to see that movie. The next time I go pursuing, <laughs> pursuing love and form, I'll think of Romeo and Juliet, and maybe that'll help me. You see, that's how it works. When you keep going and opening to spirit, you keep getting these opportunities to forgive. Jenna. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, and I don't know which one. <laughs> Um, so, 
Ever since I was probably about five years old, I've been writing. Well, I've I've received songs, in you know, I heard them, sang them. It's very natural. I don't get them constantly like some writers I know do. Um, but ever since kind of going on the spiritual path. I've been very concerned with lyrics. Melodies just come uh, very natural because um, they're, they're, they're not, you can't interpret them wrong. Um, so sometimes I hear li my old lyrics, for example, of the song that I felt was channeled by Holy Spirit, but then I'll hear certain things um, and I'll go, no, no. It's not causing miracles. <laughs> I can't sing that anymore. And it it's kind of like that thing of... I guess it's just a trusting of that I'll be guided to sing which songs are right for each moment and not to worry too much about the form. But I guess it is that control thing and I feel like it blocks me when I'm... Uh, well, I don't ever sit down so sort of to write songs but it blocks me and I know there's so many more songs to come through but I I'm kind of stopping them coming through because I'm worried about the form um, because I'm worried about people uh, it not being a positive message or not being uh, interpreted properly or that it's not loving yeah that, that does feel like this is a great mechanism that the Holy Spirit is using to really help you release control because miracles are involuntary and they can't be under conscious control and so you have this huge gift and now the Spirit's saying, oh good, we'll use this huge gift now so you can relax and, and not censor it in any way or we'll use this gift to wash away your any sense of hesitation or doubt and when you think about it, that's how the Holy Spirit uses our relationships too. You know, we feel a strong connection with somebody, a strong attraction, like a feeling of, oh, this feels very important, or like destiny. And then we're, we're just being taken into a purification where our, all of our doubts and our fears and our hesitations are going to like evaporate in the light of the Holy Spirit. We have to give ourselves over to it you know, to do it. And with receiving songs and the lyrics, yeah, there can be a, a, a judge part in there that starts to judge the... I think the one that's coming to me now is because there's a really beautiful song I got that goes, um, one touch from an everlasting love, one look waves an ocean skies above, one listen, can you hear the music play, the world is alive, can you hear the world today? And I hear it say, love today. And and now, I judge it because I go, oh, there's no sky. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, wrong. Wait a minute. There's no touch, and there's no sky, so I'm throwing the whole song out. That's what Even I though do. it's a beautiful That's song. That's what I do, yeah. and it's, the melody is just gorgeous, and the piano is just like, it makes me want to cry when I play it and sing it. Um, <clears throat> oh, we, in Course in Miracles <laughs> terms, we call this Course in Miracles Nazis. <laughs> 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 where you, where they're so critical. But then I always think, yeah, it's like that kind of thing of like, oh, if, you know, if David Hoffman said this, he got wrong. <laughs> She's not teaching Course in Miracles. <laughs> well, you know, we, we always have those Course in Miracles jokes, you know, about two Course in Miracles students that get into an argument, and they're really arguing pretty viciously for four or five minutes, and finally one throws his hand up in the air and goes, that's enough. I'm not here, and you're not here, and we're not having this conversation. <laughs> That's Course in Miracles Nazi, where you, this is my example of spiritual bypass that you brought earlier. You, you have to acknowledge the emotions. You have to acknowledge what you're going, how are you going to come to an honesty, which Jesus calls consistency. That's the second characteristic of a teacher of God. If you don't come to a sense of honesty within your own mind, you know, where will you find the peace of mind? You know, not in the words. So to me, the Course is like a, a, a trampoline. It, it can spring you 
into higher states of mind, but, but don't put it onto the book, or don't put it onto the words, or don't put it onto certain phrases, because the, the ego can quote scripture, and have been doing that for the last thousands of years. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's pretty good at quoting scripture. <laughs> Uh, there's even a line in the Course where Jesus says, the ego enjoys studying itself. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good line to keep in mind, especially if you're like a 30-year Course in Miracles student, <laughs> and you're going around and you're like espousing the same words, but you still have a sense of anxiety or fear. It's, it's drawing us into practical application, it's drawing into to spring into the experience of love and joy and happiness, not to cling to the words. And even in the workbook he says, today we go beyond the words. You know, he, he, he's encouraging us into the depths, into the silence, into the stillness. There's nothing that would please Jesus more if you were doing the workbook, and you just got to a particular lesson. Maybe you're enrolled in, in Nick and Ann's uh, class, and you're on Lesson 278, and uh, you're doing it during the week, and all of a sudden on Thursday you go, Oh my God! That's it! I'm the Holy Son of God! <laughs> <laughs> and, well, that's the last class you have to attend with Nick. You've, you've graduated. <laughs> you see, it's, it's not on a timeline. The whole point is, you're, is any lesson you can get, anything that you can get from anything in this world where you've got a recognition of who you are, is that's the whole point. It's not about anything on the timeline. It's not to be accumulated or achieved in some kind of a worldly sense. So, I think it's great. I think you should let these songs sing them, some record that, them. Yeah, I just, I really want to record them, but it's again the whole recording process. I'm like, well, it's not professional enough, because I've recorded some, but it's not professional enough. It doesn't sound how I want it to sound. It needs to be perfect. So I have all these songs, literally so many, and just, they mean so much to me, but nobody's hearing them. Because... Well, I have a friend. If you, if you get some songs and lyrics, I have a friend in, uh, in the Netherlands who's got a world-class voice. I mean, a world-class voice. We're talking like, Diana Ross, or, you know, a spectacular voice, and she contacted me about a year ago just saying, oh, I'm working with the Course in Miracles now, and I'm starting to get Course in Miracle workbook lesson songs. And she recently, through WhatsApp, she sent me like 10 songs. Actually, blow you away. Yeah. It's just the most, if I wasn't recording, I would play one for you now. It's just, <laughs> her voice, ah, it's so spectacular, but... I feel like that's part of our gift. You have a gift with the songs and the lyrics, and there are those that can Even the ego is just, just going, yes, but they wouldn't like that one, because I have one about, um, it's kind of like, I love it because it's so representative of, it's both ego, but it talks about, it's just getting rid of the concepts of bad and good. So it's like, I want to be better tonight. So it's, it's, and it's just, but it's like, it's so not Course in Miracles, so I can't use that. <laughs> do you see what I mean? But so, and why you, do I need to? <laughs> don't judge it. If it works, use it. But it doesn't work for me always, because sometimes I'm not, uh, I don't know, because like, now I'm even embarrassed to even sing. I have a friend who traveled with me. I've had all these different singer-songwriters that have traveled with me, and I love all the stuff that they bring, and sometimes the songs that they think I would never want to hear are the ones that I want to hear the most. In fact, remember Donna Marie Carey? She had a song called Stuff. <laughs> Stuff. <laughs> and she had a whole repertoire of amazing songs, but she would all, we'd get in the gathering and everything, get to the end, she'd go with her guitar, is there a song you want to play? She's got all these heavenly songs, I'd play Stuff. Like, stuff? You want me to play stuff again? Yes. Stuff, 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 all just a bunch of stuff. 
Stuff over here, stuff over there, stuff in my eyes, stuff in my hair, stuff in my nose, stuff in my hair, all just a bunch of stuff. And it goes on. That stuff put away in boxes, stuff all over my clothes. Trash needs to be emptied, got stuff all over my nose. Got stuff I'll save forever, stuff with me all my life. Stuffed turkey for Thanksgiving, and stuffing on the side. See, that's the kind of stuff I like, and it seems like that's my taste in music. I, I think it's funny, I think it's a great song, it's, make, it's poking fun at the whole world. And I like, that's my kind of humor, poke fun at, the, the, at everything. Because, yeah, yeah. Now you'll go home and you'll think, I've got that damn stuff song as a jingle in my mind. <laughs> okay. Well, we're getting the sign that we have reached the end of the day. It's a magnificent day. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, David and Francis, for a wonderful day. It's been a joy to be with them, haven't it? And uh, we hope you're going to come back again. We would love to see you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and thank you all for attending, because it wouldn't have happened without you, either. So thank you to all of you. We've got another event coming up with uh, Earl Purdy. Do you know Earl Purdy? He, he's, uh, you won't be sitting around long in that one. <laughs>